Good morning and welcome to the second keynote lecture of the 7th International Conference, Communication and Reality. I would like to start uh, this brief uh, introduction with the following quotation. The internet has brought forth an unprecedented flowering of news and information, but it has also destabilized the old business models that have supported quality journalism for decades. Good journalists across the country are losing their jobs or adjusting to a radically new news environment online. We want to highlight attempts at innovation and figure out what makes them succeed or fail. We want to find good ideas for others to steal. We want to help reporters and editors adjust to their online labors. We want to help traditional news organizations find a way to survive. We want to help the new crop of startups that will complement or supplant them. In the next hour, we will have the opportunity to hear to the person in charge of the project created to make these words a reality. It is a great pleasure uh, to introduce Mr. Joshua Benton, the founder and director of the Neiman Journalism Lab at Harvard University, an effort to help journalism adapt to the internet age. Before spending a year at Harvard as a Neiman Fellow, he spent 10 years in newspapers, most recently at the Dallas Morning News. His reports on cheating on tests in the Texas public schools lead to the permanent shutdown of a school district and won the Philip Mayer Journalism Award. He has reported from 10 foreign countries, been a Pew Fellow in international journalism, and three times been a finalist for the Livingston Award for international reporting. Before Dallas, he was a reporter and rock and roll critic for the Toledo Blade. He's probably one of the major experts to answer what is the value of journalism. I'm sure that we will hear to a presentation that will give us some clues to answer this key question in the lecture, Journalism After the Flood. And I expect good news, because as they say in the lab, we are fundamentally optimistic. So Joshua, all yours. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I don't know how much optimism I can give you. I can give you a little bit of optimism. I'll have a little at the end that's a little bit optimistic. But uh, uh, thank you to those of you who invited me here. It's a great pleasure to talk with you. Um, unlike just about everybody else that uh, you're going to be, you've heard from and will be hearing from, I am not strictly speaking an academic. I know when, when Klaus first invited me, I said, just so you know, uh, you know, I have no PhD. I'm, I'm a, a journalist observer. Uh, who's interested in these issues and has tried to do some research on them. But um, in a lot of ways, I feel like I was just sort of born at the right time. I was born in 1975, which meant I was headed to university in the summer of 1993, and that was when I bought this book, The Whole Internet User's Guide and Catalog, which had uh, a chapter at the end about this new thing called the World Wide Web, which seemed kind of, kind of cool. Um, I feel like I, I grew up loving newspapers and loving, uh, loving the traditional media. I grew up in a small town in South Louisiana. So when I went to college, I, I was editor-in-chief of my college newspaper, but I also had this side career on, on the web. I paid for all my, be my beer and pizza in college by, by building websites. And when I went on to, uh, as we just heard, uh, when, we talk, when I went to newspapers and worked at the Dallas Morning News and was an investigative reporter and a foreign correspondent, I had this secret life of little web experiments, including running what was, I think, no one's contradicted me on this, the, the largest illegal mix CD trading operation in the world. Um, every month, the CD Mix of the Month Club it was called, and every month uh, I would make a mix CD of music I was finding interesting. Other people around the world would do the same, and we'd all mail them to each other. Doesn't that seem very early 2000s? And, uh, it, and it, it got to a point where it was, you know, thousands of CDs uh, in, you know, padded envelopes on my, on my living room floor. Finally had to walk away from that. Uh, anyway, Klaus asked me to give a little bit of introduction to, to uh, Neiman Lab and, and what we do. Uh, I usually describe us as 85% newsroom, 15% think tank. Um, Fundamentally, when, when I started Neiman Lab, I, I was trying to solve for the problem of that, that there, were, there were lots of discussions about the future of digital journalism. Uh, they were often very ideological. Uh, they were people who come from a print background who thought that the internet had nothing positive to offer, that was destroying everything that was good and holy, versus people who grew up on the internet and were embracing its, its possibilities, who thought that the old world had nothing to offer and, you know, let's, let's just watch the old news institutions burn. Uh, and we wanted to invest in having reporting and research that was open to the wonders of the internet, but still saw some value in what traditional journalism did. 
So uh, we really do uh, think like we act, we're a news organization. We are an online news organization about online news organizations. It's very meta. Um, along with doing uh, reporting and writing, we've published about 3,000 articles in the oh, four and a half years since we launched in fall of 2008. Um, we also work on longer term projects. We're going to have a, a major oral history project that's coming out this fall that traces, uh, traces through uh, the history and the evolution of digital journalism from 1980 to the present, talking to a lot of uh, very interesting people that I think you're going to enjoy. Uh, project this summer around monetizing mobile, which is a big question for a lot of news organizations. We also work on some technology projects. Uh, we've built a, a Twitter aggregation engine uh, around topic called Fuego that we're going to be open sourcing soon, and some other things that are in the works. Um, but if you're interested in the intersection of technology and, and journalism and how traditional news organizations are evolving and new news organizations are, are being built, uh, I hope you'll come to our website and read our stuff. Um, your, your, your subject at this conference is breaking the, the media value chain. And when I, when I first read that, my, my initial response was, well, we need to figure out what the value is. Um, before, before you figure out what the value is before you figure out how it's chained up. You know, th there are a lot of different ways to think about what journalism provides, a lot of different lenses you could put on it. So if you think about things as a political scientist, you think, well, journalism provides the information necessary for involved decision making in a democracy. Journalists love to focus on that piece as well, even though, as any, if there are any political scientists in the room, the literature shows that the connection between the two is not, it's much more complicated than just we write story, democracy gets better. Uh, if you're a social psychologist, you might think that the, the purpose of journalism is to provide a common basis for conversation, to provide uh, a common thing that people can talk about to encourage those sorts of relationships and interactions. If you're a neurologist, you might think, uh, well, we, we, people consume the news because they, it provides a steady source of novelty. And there's this tiny piece of our brain, the substantia nigra ventral, ventral tegmental area, I always have to read that one. Uh, really, really like seeing new things. And news organizations provide new things on a pretty predictable, regular basis. If you think about it as an economist, you might think, well, I, how I read the news because I want to obtain useful information, things that I will be able to get some sort of return on the investment of time that I put into it. There are certain kinds of journalism where that return is very obvious, others where it's not. And finally, the a storyteller lens would say, uh, we as humans love narratives. We love, we love stories. We love to be told stories. We love to engage with stories. And news organizations provide stories every day. Um, these are all true, and they're, they're all not the whole story, obviously. And there are probably uh, others that we could, we could talk about. But uh, it, the story of, of, of what journalists produce and the value from it is, is a complicated one, and one that uh, has been thrown open into open question by the fact that a lot of traditional models are having a lot of difficulties. And we also have these new things that are coming along and replacing or at least supplementing them. I wanted to talk today about an idea that I've been thinking about uh, quite a bit that I actually haven't, I've never given a talk about before or written about. So I'm, I'm interested in, in your feedback, but a framing that to me makes sense as a way to, to think about uh, the challenges that the news business faces. And that is an idea that I'm calling asset light news. I don't know if anyone has ever heard the, the, the term of art asset light before. It's a, it's a term that comes originally from the world of, of management consulting and management studies. Uh, if you think about how industries worked uh, 40 years ago, uh, they had big fact. I mean, this is a broad generalization, but they had big factories. They had, had huge, uh, uh, big inventories that they kept in big warehouses. And industry was very capital intensive. You bought big, you, you, you built factories, you bought machinery, you owned that process, and that's where you derived your value. Uh, asset light manufacturing and asset light business is the idea that uh, as a business, you might be better off separating out the asset heavy piece and doing, doing that as a separate part of your, your business stream. So for example, this would be uh, companies like Walmart or Dell or other companies that have really worked focused on making efficient their supply chain, doing just-in-time manufacturing so that you can have a direct correlation between when an order is placed and when a part gets made that gets shipped out to someone. Or you look at some, a company like Apple, the, you know, the most profitable company in the world that doesn't bring up oil out of the ground, but yet which doesn't own its own factories, which outsources all that to a company like Foxconn and saying that even though that's really important, we feel it's better to not have that be part of our business. 
So asset light uh, management and in industry has been a, a trend for, for some time over the last decade. But uh, Mary Meeker, who's an internet analyst at uh, Kleiner Perkins, has talked about whether asset light uh, could be a, a model for thinking about consumer behavior as well. She's used the term a the asset light generation to describe people who are, who are rising up, uh, you know, young people today. If you think about my CD Mix of the Month Club, I wasn't just mentioning it for no reason, it all ties together. Um, the, my CD Mix of the Month Club didn't work because it got too big. There were too many CDs. It took too long to burn all of these CDs and to stuff them into envelopes and to write the, write the addresses on the envelopes and take them to the post office. It was a pain. And when you think about, you know, as a, as a former rock critic and someone who's interested in music, I had this enormous, I, I have now in my basement, because I never sold them before they became valueless, you know, many, many, many thousands of CDs. Uh, now, th those became asset lighter when they became the 75,000 MP3s that are on my computer. Um, and people who previously would have invested in having dedicated stereos instead listen to those MP3s on their phone, a device they're already be carrying around. If you can think about, uh, if you're a movie buff, you, used to, you might have had previously a giant collection of VHS tapes. Now you might just subscribe to Netflix and have a stream that you can access at any point that has a database of movies far greater than anything you could have on your own as, an, as a set of assets, but you can access it wherever you want, whenever you want. Uh, Look at something like Airbnb, uh, you know, one of, one of the companies that is trying to get out of hotels as independent, freestanding places to stay, designed around hospitality, but instead are just using the spare room in your house that you might have anyway, using that as a way of, of, uh, of make, solving the problem of giving people a place to stay. Uh, one place where uh, places like Barcelona are far ahead of places in the United States, bike sharing programs, which have become popular now in the United States. Why have your own bike when you could instead have the benefit of having bikes everywhere that you can take when you need them? The, if, I, if I could, so, oh, I was supposed to mention Spotify as well. Uh, if you're thinking of in a similar sort of model of, I, I don't listen to my 75,000 MP3s anymore because I have a Spotify collection, uh, subscription, and while they don't have all of my MP3s, they have a really big chunk of them, and it's a lot easier than figure out how to move around all my songs. So if, you, if I were to summarize what asset light means as philosophy, you could think of it as the rise of digital technology enabling habits that discourage ongoing commitments and encourage just-in-time access to goods and services that meet needs. So if this, is, if this is what asset light means, what does asset light news mean? When we talk about the impact that digital technology has had on news in the context of time, the, the word that we always use is now, right? The whole, when we talk about what the web has done to reporting, it's that it's make it, made it real time, made, sped it up, it's meant that you don't have time to wait to write your story for tomorrow's paper, it's that everything has moved, has become faster. And that is true, uh, the, those pressures put on journalists are real, it influences the content, that's a very real phenomenon. But I think we forget too often that the internet and, and digital technology has had the, an opposite effect as well which is that it has also removed news consumption from time. If, you, if 20 years ago you missed a day's newspaper, you were busy that day and you didn't read the paper, or you missed a news broadcast, and there was a story that you didn't see or that you didn't read, too bad. It just was a lost story to you. And part of the reason why people invested so much time in consuming that news was because you had to invest it in real, you had to uh, ingest it in real time. I'm reminded of a song by a band called The Lemonheads. Not a particularly great band, not even a great song, but I always love this lyric, I can't go away with you on a rock climbing weekend. What if something's on TV and it's never shown again? 1996, it's a very 1996 sentiment, right? It's, there, it's, this is not an excuse that you, it would work quite as well today because chances are you'll be able to find that TV show you know, online or in some other context. So if you think about the, if, the time placedness of, of news consumption was a big part of why people invested so much into it. Now that you can, if, if something becomes important to you, you can go back and catch up. If I can completely ignore a story for weeks and months at a time and then decide I'm suddenly interested in it. Or something which was a, a simmering story that was sort of in the background suddenly becomes a big story. I can go back and find out what I need to know. And that, that abstraction away from time in a way, I think, is, is what I think leads to this asset light news. The idea that the investment doesn't have to be ongoing, you can be just in time. 
In a sense, it, I'm reminded of, I tried to find a, a cute picture of this, and couldn't, sorry. But, uh, you know, if you think about Victorian era travelers going on a grand tour somewhere, and they would go around with all their manservants and these giant trunks full of everything, because they were going to be gone for six months, and there was no, they, if they didn't have something at the start, they weren't going to be able to buy it when they got to Cairo, right? Uh, that's sort of the same same sort of idea. This the idea that now, if you know, when I when I flew here today, I I I frankly didn't know what flight I was on until I got to the airport because I knew it was on my phone. I knew I was going to have an e-ticket, and I knew it was going to work out. And it did, thankfully. I didn't screw it up. Um, it, for those of you who are who have followed uh, you know, information management studies over over time, you know that this idea of of uh, Dealing with an enormous sea of information and the unmanageability of it is not something that the internet created. There are plenty of great quotes through time of people uh, being completely stressed out by the you know, invention of the printing press. And there are all these books. It's not right. There are all these books. There's a great video that maybe if we have some time later I'll show of, uh, of uh, a video tech system that was introduced in 1982 in the United States that is going to be part of the Oral History Project. This was a uh, a, an effort where you could have connected, connect your phone line your, to your television set and very slowly see news headlines on in 1982. And the promotional video for this just went on and on about what a time of information overload 1982 was. There are multiple radio stations. There are like several TV news broadcasts. There are multiple magazines, which seems laughable today that that would constitute anyone's idea of information overload. Um, but this is a, a, a real problem that's, that's gone on for a long time, and it, I think asset light news is a way that people are choosing to respond to that. There's one line in an article uh, published in the New York Times by, in 2008 by Brian Stelter. The story itself has been long forgotten, but there was one line in it which gets quoted back to me uh, in the sort of future of news world at least once a month. And this is it. It's about a woman who was doing a focus group uh, of college students about news consumptions. And this one college student said this, if the news is that important, it will find me. I don't need to read the newspaper every day. I don't need to watch the TV news every day because there's a bunch of stuff in there I don't care about. And I can choose to be more efficient from my point of view by waiting until there's something I really need to know and I'm going to hear about it. I think there's a lot of a lot of truth to that. Uh, a lot of, you know, traditional journalists may may not like this idea, but I think there's there's a fair amount of truth to that. Yeah, uh, who here has ever used Google Reader, the RSS reader, or some other RSS reader? Okay, you know, Google Reader is dying. If you haven't, you know, June 30th is when that goes away. Uh, Richard Gingras, who uh, runs news products for for Google, was asked why Google was killing Google Reader. Now, this is again RSS, so this is you subscribe to something, it flows in every headline from that source that you've choose, chosen to subscribe to, in this giant thing that looks like an inbox, and you go through it. And in an interview with Wired uh, a week or two ago, this is what what he said about why Google was killing Google Reader. As a culture, we've moved into a realm where the consumption of news is a near constant process. Users with smartphones and tablets are consuming news in bits and bytes throughout the course of the day, replacing the old standard behaviors of news consumption over breakfast, along with a leisurely read at the end of the day. This, this to me, describes a similar phenomenon. News, news is not something you sit down with in mind to consume. It is something that sort of, that bleeds into every element of your life because you're always carrying around a device that can access it. When you have a spare moment, you'll do that. Because you're following on a social network, you're gonna see stories in that stream, whether you intended to see news or not, it'll show up. And, and to me, this, this idea of asset light news is a way towards helping to explain some of the things that, that sometimes seem unusual about what we know about news consumption patterns. So we hear a lot about how young people don't read news anymore. They don't, they don't consume news anymore. And, and there's some, some evidence to back that up, uh, some that, that, that disagrees with it. But if you go along with the traditional idea that people consume news so that they can be better informed citizens and, and all that, um, what would explain that, as you can see from the last four numbers here in the bottom right, that in the United States, voter turnout and voter turnout among young people has been going up ever since the internet came along. Even though news consumption, as we traditionally define it by young people, is, has been declining, these people are more engaged. And as someone who's you know, lived through the last few presidential elections, I can tell you there are a lot of young people who are extremely engaged. They might not have been people who were reading the New York Times every day, though. And there's also another, another element of, of news ingestion patterns that sometimes can, it seems confusing, that if you, if you chart 
uh, who are the people who are most informed about political issues in the United States? And I know there's been some research done in other countries as well. Um, the people who are most informed, who will be able to tell, recite the names of the Supreme Court justices and are going to be able to tell you about whether a bill got passed and the rest. These are people who have very strong ideological commitments on the left or on the right. A lot of stuff in the political science literature. Uh, Alex uh, Abramson at Emory's done some good work around this. Uh, it's the people in the middle uh, who generally don't know what the hell's going on. And at a certain level, this makes total sense, right? If you're really interested in politics, it seems logical that you'd probably be interested because you have some opinion. You're on the left or you're on the right, and you have some opinion. That's why you find this subject matter interesting. And the people who are sort of in the fuzzy middle are people who don't have a strong commitment one way or the other, and therefore don't invest the time to learn this information. Um, but it's sort of at odds with the way we traditionally think about news. Uh, many times when you think about, when journalists talk about the need for people to consume their product, it's as a moderating force. It's that conservatives need to read other points of view so they can understand that they should come to the middle, and liberals need to read this for the, along the same sort of lines. It's, and this is a particularly American phenomenon, since the American conception of, of ideology and media is different than it is in much of Europe. But that, that, that fact, uh, the idea that, that consuming more news is correlated with uh, having more extreme points of view is a way that really varies with the way that journalists often conceive, conceive of their work. You know, I tend to think that news consumers are fundamentally economic animals, just like humans are economic animals. They, they consume news the same way that they consume other media when they feel that they're getting, getting something out of it. And some people, that's going to be, they're going to be entertained by it. If you're a politics junkie, you're going to read a site like Politico in the United States because you love politics, and that's, it's, going to, it's hitting your pleasure sensors. You might cons you know, Anthony Downs had his, his, his famous uh, theory of the four types of information needs. Producer, need, producer information, consumer information, uh, entertainment information, and voter information. You know, if you're, if you're a stockbroker and you read the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, that's producer information. It lets you do your job better. You make more money, theoretically. Consumer information is, I need to buy a car, so I need to figure out what's the best car, so I'm gonna read some reviews. Makes you have, make a more informed decision. Entertainment information is what Kim Kardashian did yesterday, or, you know, a, a great novel, anywhere in between. And voter information is the piece that doesn't have the strong economic incentive behind it because it's very unlikely. For the first three, you invest the time, you get a reward for your investment. You make, a sm you make more money, you make a smarter buying decision, you're entertained. If you learn more about a bill that's going through the legislature or you know, the Congress or, or whatever, it's very unlikely that you're going to be the one person when it's time to vote who's going to decide the election. It's very unlikely that there's going to be a real return on your investment. So a lot of the business models that we're seeing in the United States are really focused on trying to figure out how news generation can satisfy one of those first three needs for someone and, and, and use the benefits of that to inform a broader population. You know, um, and as I said, people are economic animals. Pablo Boschkowski at, uh, at Northwestern, you know, you may have seen his work that showed, uh, he did a study in Argentina that showed that as you might expect, people are not, as inter not very interested in political news until 30 to, to 60 days before an election. When an election's been called, they, they suddenly have an extra incentive to learn about the issues, and they do. They read more politics stories, they engage with the information more, they comment more often, they, they decide this is worthy of the investment of my time. So if, if this shift that, uh, towards asset light news, if it's real, who knows, I just made it up, maybe it's not real. Um, but what, it raises some, some questions. How, how does this line up with the idea of, of paywalls and digital subscription models for news organizations, which are, after all, des designed around the idea that there's going to be one news organization that you feel a strong enough commitment to that you're willing to pay on a regular committed basis to, to getting news from it? Um, you can see digital subscriptions both from an asset light and from, a, from an asset heavy perspective. There's a survey that, that, uh, that we did uh, a couple months ago that we actually haven't released the data with. You get the first sneak peek. Uh, whoop, there, ah, sorry. There you go. You can't read it, so I'll, I, I didn't have time to make it pretty for you, but um, we surveyed uh, uh, just over 1,000 13 to 22 year olds and asked them one question. If you heard there was a big breaking news story, what is the one website you would go to? Does anyone want to guess what the big blue slice is? The one slice that clearly dominates? You can read it if you, if you have good eyesight. It's Google. 
It's not a news organization. It's Google. Um, other things that did well are include Twitter and Facebook and, and places where they would assume this is sort of a version of if the news is that important, it'll find me, right? I, can fig I'll, I don't need to go to it and have a strong commitment to a news organization. I can have a broader commitment to the internet's going to figure it out for me in the form of a search engine. I really think that this idea is a real challenge to news organizations to try and figure out how to serve these new sets of needs. When you think about the journalism that news organizations produce, it is still in almost every case, built around informing someone who is interested right now. Um, we still write stories that are, here's what's happened in the last 24 hours about this story that's been going on for 10 years. That's not particularly useful if you've suddenly become interested in that story and you haven't been reading all those other stories about all the other previous sets of 24 hours over the last 10 years. Um, you know, if you look at, uh, we had a, in the United States, we had a very long and sort of still have a very long debate about healthcare policy. Went on and on and on forever. If you were really interested in it, that was the most amazingly well covered story in the history of journalism because there were so many remarkable detailed analyses of what every bill was proposing, the, the extremely wonky details. Um, but I wasn't that, I mean, I was interested in the abstract, but I wasn't going to follow all that stuff. How do you figure out how to create a news product that can be useful to the person who only wants a summary, who only wants that, I haven't been paying attention for the last three months, catch me up to date, tell me what I need to know right now. That's something news organizations don't do very well. I want to shift a little bit and, and talk about one other area that um, I'm less than optimistic about, sorry, um, um, which is mobile uh, and the rise of smartphones and tablets. Um, I imagine I don't have to tell anyone in this audience, uh, well, a lot of things, but among them that a lot of people are using smartphones and tablets these days. Their numbers keep growing. Um, and I don't think that we have really come to grips with the impact that these devices are having on our lives. You may have seen there was an image that went around the, the internet uh, a month or two ago that just showed a, a photo of a concert from 1995, and then a photo of, the, of another similar concert in 2013. And they were identical, except for that one of them had everyone holding their phone up to take pictures and record audio and video. And we, I, don't, I really don't think we, as, as, as human beings or as news institutions, have really understood what this means and what, how this changes a lot of fundamental things about how we access information. Um, I wrote something about this slide on Neiman Lab recently that I, I said made it the scariest slide in journalism. I don't know how well you can see it, but the, these, this is from um, Mary Meeker's uh, uh, slide deck from uh, D12. Each of these, you see print, radio, television, internet, and mobile. The two columns, the, the yellow column, the gold column, represents what percentage of our time consuming media, and this is US data, is spent in that medium. So, 42% of our time spent consuming media is spent watching television. The blue bar is what percentage of our advertising dollars goes towards that medium. So 43% of our ad dollars go towards television. It's a pretty good balance. Now, it's not locked in stone that it's necessarily true that ad revenue is going to follow attention. It doesn't have to do it in lockstep, but it kind of makes sense that it would. You see on the, on the far left, print only consumes 6% of our attention but it still gets 23% of our of ad dollars. And on the far right, mobile, now, mobile devices now attract 12% of our attention and only get 3% of our ad dollars. Last year, those numbers were, uh, that was only 1% of ad dollars were in mobile. So it went from one to three in one year. It went from the, one, mobile advertising went from a $1.2 billion business to a $4 billion business in the US in one year's time. So whenever I, I'm, I'm, I'm risking feeling optimistic about the print business, I think of this slide. <laughs> because uh, it would stand to reason that 23% of ad money that's going towards print is at some point going to normalize towards that 6% number. And that's an extraordinarily scary fact. Um, one other uh, slide. This is uh, India's internet traffic, desktop, laptop versus mobile devices. And you can see that in May of last year, uh, a year ago, mobile traffic overtook desktop and, and laptop. And it is a, a, a unique case. It's not the same as Europe. But these same trends are, work, are playing out everywhere. Uh, at the New York Times, on election night, the majority of their traffic came from mobile devices for the first time. Um, you, you, you see that same sort of trend now on a, on a typical day at the Times. It's around 40% of their traffic comes from mobile devices. That's web and app combined. 
so even though uh, only 13% of overall internet traffic is at 13%, it seems it's higher for news organizations and it's higher in developed countries, or it's, high, it's higher in, in countries with higher smartphone penetration. Um, the reason why I'm not optimistic about, uh, about this is that I feel like mobile is another reset for people's habits. I think a lot of news organizations, when the web came along, anticipated that people's habits would somehow make the transition from one medium to another. And if they read the Dallas Morning News in print, they were going to go to dallasnews.com on the web. They also expected that advertising dollars would make a similar move. Um, that's, that hasn't turned out to be the case. Um, and I think while the rise of mobile devices is not quite as big of a paradigm shift as the original arrival of the World Wide Web, I think it's not that far away. It is really a chance for people to change their habits. And we are already seeing that people are seeking out different kinds of sources on mobile devices. And they're seeking out different kinds of experiences on mobile devices. And yet, just about every news organization in the world, their, their crappy mobile site is still just a list of headlines. It doesn't in any way customize to the experience that, that might be offered up for a particular mobile environment. It doesn't use the data that it could have from monitoring what is on my personal device, the kinds of stories I'm most interested in. We've seen very little innovation in push notifications, the idea that you might be able to intelligently give me information exactly when I'm going to want it and appreciate it the most. Basically, news organizations haven't done a damn thing. And that's really disappointing to me. Um, we've, we've seen some, some bits, and what, what's happened is it's, it's allowed a new generation of aggregators, whether that's Flipboard and Zeit and you know, sort of tablet aggregators, or the rise of social networks like, like Twitter and Facebook, which get the majority of their traffic on mobile devices. It's basically taken the power away from the news organization. Now, I, don't, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't have a problem with Twitter having some power too, but uh, for those of us who appreciate traditional news values and would like to find a way to get those values to transition to a new digital home, it's disappointing that we haven't seen as much uh, activity there. And uh, we're not really seeing very many signs of, of that changing, which is unfortunate. I promised some optimism, so I saved that for the end. Uh, I should have titled this <laughs> Journalism Underneath a Flood, but I guess after the flood works too. Uh, all right, this is the scary chart section. Um, the <laughs> I know you think the last section was the scariest terrorist section. Um, the, when I, whenever I, I, I speak in Europe, there, there's all, always lots of interest in, in the United States case, uh, in part because uh, we, you know, our, the bottom fell out earlier uh, than in here in the U.S. for the traditional news business, the newspaper business in particular, than it did uh, in, in Europe. Um, but we're also on the positive side, also I think be, being a little bit earlier and seeing the new flowers of what new online native and sustainable news organizations might look like. So this is newspaper advertising revenue in the United States. The blue line is just print. The, the, small, the, the red line, which looks a lot like the blue line, includes online advertising, which, which tells you that there's not a whole lot of money in online advertising for newspapers. Um, this is inflation adjusted. Uh, and actually, this goes 2000, yeah, so it's actually, the last line goes a little bit d deeper. This isn't fully up to date. Um, basically, from if you get rid of the inflation adjustment, in 2006, total advertising revenue in print for newspapers was about $50 billion. Last year, it was about $18 billion. Um, that money's never coming back. This puts this in the context of, uh, of a rise in digital advertising. Digital advertising exists, it's growing. Uh, it's disappointing in a number of ways, but nonetheless, it is a growing, growing field. Uh, you can see the blue line, newspaper declines, the, the gold brown line showing the, the digital ad market going up, but the sadly stable green line is the amount of money that newspapers are making off that. Newspapers, uh, by some estimates, newspaper websites only make up around one and a half to two percent, depending uh, what numbers you use, of web traffic uh, on the internet in the United States. Um, so pe these people are consuming media, they are consuming information, they are, they are engaging with information online. It doesn't seem to be coming from the news organizations that have traditionally produced it and profited off of it. This is a terrible chart that I didn't make, so I can say it's a terrible chart, but I stole it. Um, but just to give you an idea, I'll just zoom in. Those numbers on the, on the right are the percentage declines in circulation for major American newspapers from 2005 to 2013. So you can see that you know, anywhere from a third to more than half uh, drop off. Newspapers are kind of screwed. 
but a little optimism. Um, if this is a, I, I saw the word disruption mentioned a few times in paper titles, and uh, I know that uh, when we were talking about the value chain, I'm sure Clayton Christensen's name has come up at some point uh, during these sessions. You know, his, his argument is, is that fundamentally when a, when a field and industry is disrupted by a technological uh, innovation, what it happens at the low end. It happens in the, in the piece of the business that is considered too low quality, too cheap, that the incumbent players who have become very profitable and really moved up market almost don't care about it. You can very much look at the way that newspapers talked about bloggers in the early 2000s as being, you know, living in their mother's basement and wearing their, sitting in their underwear, complaining about things on the internet. It was, it was really considered unclean. And then three years later, every newspaper had 30 blogs. Same thing with Twitter. It's this terrible medium that only, you know, only has 140 characters. You can't do anything worthwhile on that. And then every journalist is on Twitter. This, this march up the value chain, his theory would, would predict, is that these, these newcomers start off at the low end and then move their way up and start doing higher quality work and start eating away at the work of the incumbents. And I think we're seeing that. We, we actually really are. You can see that by looking at online news organizations that have won Pulitzer Prizes. So no one had won an, a Pulitzer Prize before 2010 who didn't work for a newspaper or a wire service. In 2010, a guy named Mark Fiore won it as for editorial cartoons, uh, he, but they didn't run any newspaper. These were online-only editorial cartoons that ran on the website of the San Francisco Chronicle. Okay, so he's still sort of working for a newspaper or a company that owns a newspaper, but nonetheless, online-only. That's interesting. That same year, ProPublica uh, won its first Pulitzer Prize for a project that it produced and then ran in the New York Times, which it partners with a lot of news organizations. And ProPublica is an exceptional case. They have uh, a very wealthy sugar daddy who gives them $10 million a year. Um, and it was published in the New York Times. So, hey, good for them, but still they're sort of an exception to the rule. So it was kind of easy to get past that. Well, the next year they won another Pulitzer Prize not for anything that ran in the New York Times, there were stories that ran only online that were only produced by ProPublica. So, okay, that's, that's kind of legit. And that same year, the Huffington Post, the dirty, low-brow, low cheap and free content Huffington Post won a Pulitzer Prize for a 10-part series on, on uh, veterans returning from, from war. And very well done, very, very well produced, you know, in-depth, does everything that you'd want a Pulitzer Prize winning story to, to do, uh, and at the Huffington Post. In 2012, uh, Politico, which is a newspaper in a sense, in that they publish newspapers once in a while, but is mostly a website and was born a digitally native, won its first Pulitzer. But then in 2013, we had our first uh, case of a real online only underdog, Inside Climate News, which is a, a nonprofit news organization that has four staffers, four staffers. Uh, managed to do a, a, an amazing set of stories around, around climate change that was, was good enough to win the National Reporting Pulitzer Prize on top of everything produced by the New York Times, and the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal, and the LA Times, and everybody else. And to me, in, these, in this rundown, you see this, this, this set of, of this moving up the value chain. Uh, incumbents uh, no longer have the, are the only seats at the table. Um, I've, I've been lucky enough to judge the Pulitzer Prizes the last two years, and uh, it's by no means established that traditional news organizations are the only folks who can, who can win anymore. Uh, I don't know how popular BuzzFeed is here in Spain, but if you know about BuzzFeed, you probably know because they have pages like this that involve stories like animals without necks. And there is, there are adorable puppies make cameo at She She Fashion Show. They really like pictures of cats. It's what they do. Um, they're even more like pictures of cats that are looking very cute with funny captions on them. BuzzFeed's been around for a few years, and they have built a huge audience by being entirely online native in every sense of the word, good and, all the good and bad senses of that, of that word. Um, but then a year and a half ago, they decided to start hiring a politics team. They now you know, cover the White House and cover Congress and break stories. They were probably one of the three or four uh, news organizations that broke the most stories in the 2012 presidential campaign this tiny corner of what is fundamentally still a cat picture operation was breaking big stories. And just last week, they hired away The Guardian's Moscow correspondent to, to be their first foreign and national security editor. If you go to BuzzFeed uh, on any given day, it's a really confusing mix of content because they still do the, the cat photos and they embrace them. They are not ashamed of them at all. Um, and they shouldn't be, damn it. Cat photos are fun. But 
it's, it's mixed in with this other kind of content. And we are, you know, we've been talking about this because you know, the theories expect that this should happen, but we actually are seeing it. We're seeing this march up the value chain. Now, it's a very different march than, than we might have hoped for in the sense that uh, the American journalism system, I think to a greater extent than, than in Europe, but you know, it's also true in Europe, our, our new journalism system was based entirely around geography. We did not have national newspapers because we're a big damn country and you couldn't deliver national newspapers. So we had lots of very strong regional and metropolitan newspapers that had huge newsrooms that invested a lot in doing lots of really good reporting and made an enormous amount of money. When I went to work for the Dallas Morning News in the year 2000, it, the newsroom staff was 670 people. Now it's 270 people. Now you could look at that as, wow, that's a lot of people fewer than it used to be. Or you can look at it as, that's 270 people. That's still a pretty good sized newsroom. So online, you don't see that attention to geography at all. There, the, there are sites that, that uh, non-profit sites and some for-profit sites that, that do a perfectly good job covering local communities and in some cases up to the size of a decent sized city. But they are much smaller and they have been much less successful. Um, fundamentally, the, the internet has taken the organizing principle of journalism and moved it from geography to interest, what you're interested in. Um, so that's a real challenge because our democracy is still function, you know, structured around geography. You know, there is no representative from cat photos. There's a representative from Dallas, right? Um, so that, that's a very real challenge, and I think the, the biggest one left to, to deal with. We, we've seen a lot of other resorting that I, I, I could go on, but I'll, I think I, I'll just uh, would like to hear any questions from, from, from you guys. Uh, fundamentally, I do think, and this is new in, in 20, 2012, 2013, we're starting to see what the world looks like after after the flood to tie it all together. But also just to see, we've gone from a time of just pure bleeding, which is what we went through for a while, to bleeding partnered with the signs of a new journalism ecosystem institutionalizing itself. Some people who I think were not very smart students of history thought that what was gonna happen with the internet is that we were just going, everything was gonna be atomized, everything was gonna be destructured, and we we're all gonna have our individual blogs and there would be no news organizations. Well, that's not the way that things work. It's, it's really an accordion effect, is that things break apart and they come back together. They come back together in forms that are more attuned to current situations. I think that's what we're seeing in journalism and that's why at a fundamental level I'm optimistic about it. Okay. Thank you, Joshua, for this optimistic, well, a little optimistic sort of. uh, lecture. And I'm sure that we're going to have some questions from the audience. So, any questions around? Come on, yeah. <laughs> you, have the, you have the microphone there. I could just repeat the question. If, okay, there we go. Yeah. It was a very nice lecture. I really enjoyed it. Thank um, you. When, when you started to um, get optimistic and, and, and mentioned um, sort of, you know, how journalism moves up now, the value chain, that's a sort of kind of um, moving up in terms of quality, um, the, the quality of news production. That's how I understood it. And I kind of just wonder, um, how that would sort of kind of um, translate to the sort of you know f financial survival of 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 the whole of the whole profession because there was sort of in, at least in your talk there was sort of no indication that um, um, the keeping or maintaining or even kind of improving the quality um, would eventually translate in a in a in a new form where where the kind of profession yeah. the professional um, activity, the getting paid for, for, for what you do, that this will necessarily be secured. Right. Well, oh. <laughs> okay. the, panel, the panels are supposed to start at 12 o'clock already, but we have decided to leave some time for questions, okay? So uh, we're going to tell people who are already over there that the panels are starting 10, 15 minutes late, right? <laughs> Sorry, I went long. Um, I think, um, well, there's a fundamental fact that I don't think there's going to be any way to get around it, which is that the cost structures of traditional media are not going to be supported by these new media outlets. So 
the Dallas Morning News, to use the example, as Holly said, when I got there, they had 670 people in the newsroom. But the, the newsroom was only 20% of the total spending of the newspaper, as is the case at most newspapers. Um, the rest is paper and trucks and HR staffs and all the rest. You know, the, news, the newspaper as a whole had a staff of over 2,000 people. Um, and when you look at these, you know, you look at Inside Climate News with four, um, I don't think you're going to see a time where you get to anywhere near that sort of a scale. Even the largest examples, look at the Huffington Post, for example. The Huffington Post now has a staff that's in the, I think, 300 range, but that's newsroom and, and non-newsroom. Um, you do see a, a flipping of the, tr of the cost structure. You'll see online news organizations that will have a much larger percentage of their money invested in news. So even though they're smaller organizations, they can get by with having lower t total revenue. Um, and also, to be completely honest, a lot of these news organizations are getting by by paying really talented 25-year-olds not that much money, um, whereas newspapers that have been around forever um, don't have that same option to the same degree. Um, I do think, I really think, so BuzzFeed, for example, makes a lot of money off of sponsored advertising. People can like sponsored advertising or not like sponsored advertising. There are good and bad things about it. But it does make a quite, a, quite a bit of money for them. If you look at um, another new company that I didn't mention that is really, really good, um, Vox Media, uh, that publishes a technology site called The Verge and a sports site called SB Nation and a video game site called Polygon. And they, are, they make quite a bit of money and do really good work within those fields. They have really top-notch people, do beautiful designs and presentations, I mean, really top-notch stuff. But they're able to do that because they only write stories. They, they're, all their sites are targeted at 18 to 35-year-old men with money. They write about sports, video games, and technology, right? Um, so that business model is going to work fine for them. Um, I do think that if you're asking the question, how are you going to get the money to support coverage of poverty? We don't have an answer to that question. I, well, we do have an answer to that question to a certain degree, and that's it's going to be a nonprofit news organization that's going to do it. But um, the, the thing is, even though newspapers aren't generating money online, a lot of people are making money online. It's just that you, there's not enough to be able to sustain the, the, the old models. And that's why I was having an interview earlier uh, today where someone said, who, who deserves the blame for what happened? Is it, is it the publishers? Is it the owners of the, new, of the newspapers? Is it their fault? And I, at a certain level, yeah, but it's not as if every newspaper publisher in the United States is an idiot. They're not. There are just really big forces at work that they have almost no ability to, to control. And fundamentally, newspapers that are of a certain size, it's really hard to say, well, we could be totally sustainable and make money if we had one eighth the staff. That, that's just a really hard thing to do, and news organizations, it's, it's a lot easier to start something new and grow to that point and that's why I feel very, I am optimistic about news. I'm not optimistic about, exist, about traditional news organizations. Um, I, I think the forces working against them are often just too strong to deal with. Yes, another question there. Well, I have a, a, a few thoughts on that. One is that I'm a big believer in the idea of journalism education as a liberal art. You know, um, it used to be that there were people who studied poetry because they were going to become poets, and being a poet was a profitable career. Being a poet's not really a profitable career anymore, right? But people still learn about poetry because it, it's trains their mind in ways that they find valuable. I was a history major in college. I had no interest or no intention to become a historian, but nonetheless, learning about history has helped me in a, in a lot of ways. And I really believe that journalism, I mean, journalism education, there are more applicants to journalism schools in the United States than ever, even though there are fewer traditional journalism jobs and there has been a long time. And part of that is that today's young people grew up creating media. They grew up creating media on, on their laptops and on their phones. They want, they enjoy doing it, they want to get better at it. And the skills that you learn, learning how to ask questions, learning how to write, learning how to identify the narrative thread in a story, those are all uh, skills that transfer over very, very well to other fields. 
that's my cop-out answer. Uh, I, I do think there are a lot of uh, young people who are getting good jobs at these online uh, startups. They tend to be, since, uh, since you said you're from a Midwestern university, um, they are much more concentrated in New York and DC than they used to be. Newspaper jobs were used to be pretty evenly spread around the country. Now these, these jobs are much focused on, on you know, big East Coast cities, um, which is a challenge for people who aren't in that environment. Uh, to the point that, you know, I live in Boston. Boston's a perfectly big, pro you know, prosperous city, but the jobs aren't in Boston. Like, you have to go to New York to get those jobs. Um, so I think uh, there are jobs out there. They're, they're going to be challenging to get. Um, but I, I do think that there are, there's a, there's a slice of, there, there's a great interview that was done with uh, John Harris, one of the co-founders of Politico a few years ago, about how journalists like to think of themselves as these iconoclasts as these people who speak truth to power and talk back to the man. Um, but in the United States, at least, when during the long multi-decade run of incredible profitability, the people who worked for newspapers were, looked a lot like got people who worked for General Motors in the 1950s. They were company men who loved being part of a cog in this giant machine. And for those people who want that kind of experience, journalism is not gonna be satisfying anymore. Um, but there's a different group of people who would not have wanted to be to start out in the, you know, the Plano Bureau of the Dallas Morning News and work your way up to covering, you know, the county government beat and do the sort of thing that newspaper people did. Entrepreneurial people who have ideas and want to start things for whom for it's a great environment now. It's just that it, there, the, there's not always a matchup between the skill set and the, and the abilities. Broadly speaking, I think, if I, if I were talking to a young journalism student, the first thing I would say is, do you have any interest at all in data journalism and number crunching and coding in a, in a civically oriented journalistic way? If they have any interest at all, I'd tell them to do that because that's guaranteed employment for the next 20 years. Um, as it turns out, the group of people who are interested in journalism and who are interested in, in that, there's not a ton of overlap. But if people who are, they're in a very good position. That's a good question. I think what, there was um, an, an internet analyst who was talking about if he was starting up an online news organization, what he would do is he would go to some very good journalism schools, he would find the top people and say, I will pay you, uh, let's say $50,000, a perfectly good, nothing extraordinary salary, but I, I will move you to Mexico and you'll live on the beach and you'll work remotely. Our newsroom will be there you will live like a king because it's a place that, you know, where your money will go a lot farther and basically play the geographic arbitrage and just run the operation from there. Um, the reason why people, why the, it's moved to places like New York is that um, the kinds of jobs that are, that are being created in online news organizations are very staff job heavy. Like freelancing is a very small portion of it. Um, and it's a sort of an intense experience of production throughout the day, and people have found a reward from having, having people be in one place. So um, the Gawker family of sites have this big newsroom in, in New York City, and that's where everyone sits, and they see that the benefit from that that they don't see from people you know, talking over Skype or, or whatever else. Um, I, I do think that there's an element in which that is, that might be a, a transitory thing. It could be the kind of thing that uh, as telepresence improves and whatever else, people get more comfortable with that. But I also note that mobility in the United States is not as actually high as it used to be. Um, you know, if you go, the, the percentage of people who move from city to city over the last five years is the lowest, it, it is lower than it was during any five years in the 20th century in the United States. Um, and part of that is because the economy was in terrible shape. But, um, you know, even within the United States, people say, well, if you live in Detroit and there are no jobs in Detroit, well, why don't you just move to a place where there are jobs and there are places with jobs? But people don't do that. 
So I mean, I, I'm very interested in, in in this role of geography and media consumption, and I, I I don't I don't pretend to have all the answers, but I do think that if you look at how people are consuming media, it's much more oriented around national sites and sites that often have global pretensions, and um, it's very hard to bring value from a sense of place in, a, in an online news organization. More questions? Okay. So, thanks, Joshua, for your nice uh, lecture. And sure. I hope that the, 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 the things will change for a more, to a more optimistic way. For the next all year, all my optimistic slides were right, <laughs> and all the bad ones were wrong. Thank That's you very much. Thank you.